Hello and welcome back to Black Box. I'm Miles O'Brien. And I'm Lars Perkins. We're dissecting the world's most deadly plane crash involving just a single aircraft. It was a 747, Japan Airlines Flight 123, that crashed on August 12, 1985, killing 520 passengers and crew. The pilot struggled for almost half an hour before the airliner crashed into some rugged terrain. First responders took almost 16 hours to get there, but pretty quickly there was a huge team of people on site for the rescue, recovery, and investigation efforts. Among the people who had been making a grim daily pilgrimage to the crash site was John Purvis, a Boeing engineer who led his company's team of crash investigators. These were long, hot, difficult days at the scene of the crash. They flew in and out on helicopters, spending the night in Tokyo. One night, back at the hotel, he had a eureka moment. We may have been on our third or fourth trip up to the mountain by then. He was looking at his notes. Something clicked. He called in his structural expert. They call them stress guys. He knew the airplane inside and out, and we had sketches. His name was Mel Lundberg. We studied our notes and talked what we had seen, and it turns out he had seen the same thing I did. He saw that this piece, this broken piece, had cracked through a set of rivet holes that it shouldn't have cracked through. The broken piece belonged to a crucial part of the aircraft, the aft pressure bulkhead. When you're sitting in an airliner, you're sitting in a pressurized tube. The aft or the backside of that tube is covered with a circular panel that looks like an umbrella and that absorbs the load of the pressurization, which is significant. It's a big aluminum dome, 15 feet in diameter on the 747, and it's attached at the back of the cabin. It seals up that pressurized space inside the plane. It's kind of like a cap on a soda bottle. It's there to keep the gas, in this case, air, under pressure. And get this, the piece with the ruptured rivets show clear evidence it had been repaired. He said, John, this is bad. We've got to call Seattle. And we did that right then and there. In Seattle, they had another important clue to share, a clue that would send the investigation down a new, unexpected path. The seeds of this accident were planted more than seven years before the actual crash. June 2nd, 1978, the same aircraft, tail number Juliet Alpha 8119, was operating as Japan Airlines Flight 119, flying the same route, Tokyo to Osaka. A young, inexperienced first officer, new to the 747, was the pilot flying the approach. But it doesn't go well. See, the 747 is the first multi-level commercial airliner. It had a second floor and the cockpit is on the second story, or third if you count the cargo hold. Flight 022, maintain approach, you're clear for runway 27. The pilots sit 25 feet above the pavement. If you're a noob in the airplane, you feel like you're still pretty high when you're really close to touching down, or when the wheels are close to touching down, you're still way up in the air. So that moment when pilots pull back on the controls to ease the rate of descent as they're landing, it's called a flare. If you're new to the 747, you can think it can't be time to flare yet. But as soon as you think that, the main landing gear violently hits the runway and you're still descending at 500 feet per minute. Needless to say, your passengers aren't impressed, but what happens next is worse. So when the wheels hit, the front of the plane starts to pitch down rapidly because most of the weight of the airplane is forward of the landing gear. Seeing the nose start to fall, you desperately pull back on the wheel, or yoke, to stop the nose wheel from smacking too hard on the runway. But if you overcorrect, the nose starts to rise again, and then... The tail of the 747 strikes the pavement of the runway. Tail strikes are uncommon, but not unheard of. This one isn't that bad, but it's pretty bad. 
the nose gear finally touches the ground and the airplane taxis into the gate. But inspection of the tail afterwards shows the extent of the damage. This airplane is not flying again without extensive repairs. In the language of aviation, it's AOG, airplane on ground. It's a dreaded three letters in the airline business because a 747 taken out of revenue service costs an airline tens of thousands of dollars a day, or in this case, a million plus yen a day. So no expense is spared to get AOGs back in the air. That's why Boeing has an AOG response team, a sort of special forces strike team in the world of aviation repair. They're an elite team ready to fly anywhere in the world where a plane needs repairs to get back in business. Most of them will be people that build airplanes. They're the mechanics, they're the guys on the shop floor. They're the cream of the crop. About 40 of them arrive in Osaka about two weeks after that tail strike. When the tail hit the runway, it damaged the skin, of course, but it also crunched the aft pressure bulkhead. They decided to replace only the lower half of the pressure bulkhead and splice it to the upper half. It was allowed to be done. They got busy. They go and they work two 12-hour shifts. The repair is going 24 hours a day until it's done. But the new piece of bulkhead wasn't fitting very well, perhaps because of a manufacturing defect or deformation of the fuselage. The team just couldn't get the new piece to overlap enough with the existing structure. They found they couldn't get in the required two rows of rivets with the metal they had. So what to do? There was nothing in the books on this. The engineer on the scene, whose name has never been publicly acknowledged, and John Purvis didn't want to share it with me, the engineer proposed and designed a splice plate. It's an extra piece of flat metal that would carry three rows of rivets, one row in the new piece, another row in the old piece, and a third row in the middle, going through where both pieces overlapped. The repair gets approved by Boeing and Japan Airlines. The engineer decides to get some shut-eye, leaving the execution to his peerless team of mechanics. But this three-foot strip of metal wasn't going in easily either. It was difficult to install because of the pressure dome, of course, is compound curves, and it's tight working in that area. This may seem odd that the pieces didn't perfectly fit together, but what you have to realize is almost every large aircraft is built by hand. These aren't mass-produced pieces. Every large structure in the airplane has to be made with another structure. And, you know, when you have something that's that big, there's liable to be little abnormalities, particularly in a fuselage that may have been deformed a bit because of the hard landing. Or just the repeated use, too. You never know. But it's not going to be exactly what a CAD drawing would give you, even if they had good CAD capability back in 1985. That was kind of edgy then, even. So what did the team do? They improvised. They cut the metal lengthwise into two pieces. It meant only a single row of rivets joined those two pieces of aft bulkhead. So hold on a second. This is like if you're a carpenter and you've got two pieces of wood that don't quite fit together. So you create a third piece of wood to straddle the two pieces and hold them together. Yeah, I've heard carpenters call them scabbing. You can call it a doubler. It's fairly straightforward. So you have to ask yourself, why would they split what is clearly meant to be a splice plate into two pieces? They misunderstood what the splice plate was doing and treated it more like a shim. A shim is not a splice. It's another matter entirely. It's used simply to fill a gap, not to carry any structural load. Okay, you said it. These guys were the best of the best, the cream of the crop. Do we know why that happened? They just didn't realize that that splice plate was a splice plate, not a shim. And they sort of treated it like a shim. Bad repair had only 70% of the strength of a properly spliced part. So the engineer who went to sleep, 
He comes back in 12 hours later and he's unable to see what has happened because the work has progressed and things have been covered up. Is that what happened? Exactly right. Part of the thing you do when you do a repair on the pressure vessel any place, including the bulkhead, is you put in sealant to make sure that no air leaks out. The work was done and there was sealant installed. And even if there hadn't been sealant, you probably wouldn't have been able to see it. But it was hidden by the time the engineer and the inspector in particular came back. It was a hidden time bomb ticking away. The crash investigation team estimated the bad repair was likely to fail after about 10,000 cycles. A cycle is a takeoff, a cabin pressurization, and a landing. As it turns out, the aircraft had logged 12,318 cycles before these overstressed rivets gave way. Now, when all this dawned on John Purvis, he asked his company to send out an emergency fleet-wide service bulletin to um, ask operators to inspect pressure bulkheads that had been repaired and maybe the repairs had not been properly done or properly reviewed. The service bulletin issued by Boeing, I think, came out on August 28th or 29th. Two weeks after the crash. Were there other problems found in aft pressure bulkheads uh, fleet-wide? Yes, there were some repairs that were improperly done, but those immediately got fixed. The problem the Boeing team found led to some fast action that might very well have saved some lives. This is a well-earned point of pride for John Purvis, and it's a great example of how aviation learns hard lessons. Okay, so here's where the kind of aircraft that we talked about, or the kind of 747 we talked about earlier, starts to play a role. This is, again, is the 747 version, SR. The SR meant short range, and it was built and designed just for the Japan Airlines and ANA, another Japanese airline. It doesn't fly the typical long-haul routes that we know the 747 or jumbo jets to fly. It's flying a very short route, which means it's getting pressurized, depressurized, pressurized, depressurized, way more often than a typical 747. The doomed flight, that was flight number five of a planned six flights in one day. The SR could carry 20% less fuel, but more passengers, up to 498 in early versions and more than 550 all in economy in later models. Now, the 747-SR had extra structural support in the landing gear, wings, and parts of the fuselage to accommodate the added stress accumulated from the greater number of takeoffs and landings. But importantly, there was no modification to increase the strength of the aft pressure bulkhead, and for that matter, the rest of the pressure vessel, despite the fact that it would be flexed and stressed more rapidly than on 747s than cross oceans and continents, flying longer, less frequent flights. It's not that the bulkhead problem was overlooked, Boeing actually told Japan Airlines to lower the cabin pressure, pilots call it raising the cabin altitude, to lower the stress on the aft bulkhead. And because these 747s were flying short hops at lower altitudes, passenger comfort and safety wouldn't really be impacted. So mandatory structural inspections are triggered based on the number of cycles an aircraft has flown. Flying at reduced cabin pressure the airline would be allowed to increase the number of cycles between inspections. The aft pressure bulkhead is one of the most critical parts of an airliner's structure. It's like that bottle cap, as we told you. It has to absorb and hold all the pressure in that metal tube. How much pressure? Well, we called in one of the smartest people we know in the world of aviation to try to understand better. My name is John Golia. I am a former member of the National Transportation Safety Board. He is an aircraft and power plant mechanic, an a and It's like having a PhD in aviation maintenance. As I understand it, you are the one and only a and to be on the NTSB. That's correct. From 1995 to 2004. Before that, he worked for years in the airline industry, starting as a mechanic for United, then Allegheny and U.S. Air. 
For more than 20 years, he was a Union Flight Safety Representative on accident investigation teams. He's highly respected as a consultant now. There's no one who knows more about how airplanes work and how they fail. John, why does the after pressure bulkhead need to be so strong? Because it's holding the whole tail end of the airplane together. On every airplane, there are certain places on the airplane where the forces are stronger than others. So it all comes together right where the pressure bulkhead is. And does the pressurization of the airplane really make a difference? Does that play into this at all? Oh, definitely. I'd have to do the math and say what the pressure was, but it's high. It's very high. So I did the math after we talked, and here's what I came up with. Normally, the cabin is pressurized to about 11 pounds per square inch. That's not as high as the air pressure at sea level, which is 14.7. It's about equivalent to 7,800 feet. Airplanes aren't kept at sea level pressure because that would add a lot of weight to make them strong enough. Yeah. I'm with you on that. All right, so let's uh, continue with your uh, math here. A 747 aft bulkhead is 15 feet in diameter. That's 25,000 square inches. And at 25,000 feet, there's five and a half pounds of pressure per square inch. That means you've got about 152,000 pounds of pressure pressing against the bulkhead. The bottom line is that 15 foot in diameter bulkhead it has to hold a tremendous amount of pressure, right? Tons. So that's why it's so critical. That's why it's designed to what it is. And that's why you can't afford to have any deep scratches or cracks developing back there because they will progress rather quickly. You know, Lars, his point about progression, that is a big deal. The design of that bulkhead in the 747 Think of a Japanese fan, what they call sensus. Imagine it all the way open, fully circular. That's kind of the way it looks. And then on top of that, it has concentric circles starting from the middle. So a little bit like a dartboard in that respect, or maybe a spider web. The whole design though is built with the notion that if there was some sort of failure in any one of those little portions of the pie, as it were, it would be fail safe, it would stop further rupture. And so you would have a decompression, but not as big a deal. But all of that was rendered moot because of this faulty repair. So 150,000 pounds of pressure, one row of rivets, and guess what? It propagated big time. Investigators later estimated the hole was 20 to 30 square feet. It was designed only so that one piece of the pie could fail at any given moment. But this was way bigger than that. It's like a balloon when you blow it up and you hold the end of it. When you let it go, the force of going out is going to take all the, everything with it. And that rush of air enters the tail section of the aircraft that is on the other side of the pressure vessel. Right. What happened there? Now you start to pressurize inside the tail in a structure that wasn't designed for it. Okay, so the pressure vessel is pressurized at this sort of five and a half pounds per square inch, but it's only the pressure vessel that's pressurized. If you can imagine the tail extending vertically from the fuselage, that's also an empty area, but it's not pressurized. There's no need for it to be. There's no passengers sitting there. There's no cargo that needs air or oxygen. So when the aft pressure bulkhead gives way, that essentially inflates or starts to inflate the tail. There's an emergency vent door, like a relief valve on a pressure cooker, but it was way too small. So now the pressure starts to push out, and in many of the areas, especially in the tail, you're now pushing outward. The rivets failed, but they were definitely not designed to hold the kind of pressure that happened then. It's just gonna come apart. So it would have happened pretty quickly. Yes, it would be catastrophic. If you didn't see it, you would swear it was a bomb. The AOG team for Boeing, all of them seasoned, talented aircraft mechanics, technicians, and engineers, knew that, of course. How could they make such an elementary mistake? So this was a mistake that was tantamount to leaving a ticking time bomb inside a jumbo jet. A mistake that would claim 520 lives. How could that happen? 
No one really has a good explanation, Lars, including a seasoned aviation expert, former NTSB member John Golia. He began his long career as an airframe and power plant mechanic. You know, my experience with Boeing and factory repairs, it was always over-engineered. He says he can spot them a mile away. I mean, I've gone into airplanes and looked at repairs on them and said, that's a factory repair. You can tell in a second. The way it's laid out, the material is used. There's no mistake in it. You can tell a factory repair. But not this repair. Is it possible the team knew it wasn't what it should be, but they said, ah, that's good enough? I would not believe that. I, I would not believe it. I've been around a lot of mechanics, a lot of cheap metal people, and uh, you know, I don't buy that. Would it be safe to assume the 40-person team that Boeing assembled to travel the world and get airplanes flying quickly and fixed in situ, those would be the best, wouldn't they? I've seen them in action, they're damn good, and they're also very proud. You don't get there by seniority, you get handpicked, so those guys are good, and if they saw something that they didn't like, they'd raise the roof. So, an honest mistake. I believe it would be considered an honest mistake. An oversight, a communications breakdown between engineering and the people doing the work, even though there was engineers on site, there's still communication breakdowns. I asked John Purvis, the head of the Boeing crash investigation team, the same question. It's just a tragic mistake, isn't it? Yeah, it's a mistake, and I don't think you can criminally blame anybody. I guess if I were the guy who installed it, I would sure be feeling heartburn and pain, but it's not something you throw people in jail for. But in Japan, many people thought differently. They opened a criminal investigation. The Japanese authorities decided they wanted the names of those people. Boeing refused to turn them over and refused to turn over the people, too. But they were really persistent. Eventually, police in the prefecture where the crash occurred charged 20 people, including four Boeing employees, with negligence. I guess they got the names off of some of the repair records that were in Japan, but they especially wanted the name of the inspector who inspected it, the engineer who designed it, and the mechanic or mechanics that did the actual repair. They treated it like a criminal investigation, right? Here's John Golia. Well, in many countries, you know, that's what they are. If you have an accident, what we would call an accident in Europe, a judicial system takes over the investigation. But in the U.S., aviation accident investigations have never been in the criminal realm. The underlying philosophy, amnesty allows for an open, honest assessment of what went wrong so it can be fixed. And it removes any constraints in immediately sharing whatever you find with the public. If the world wasn't told this was an unusual, specific event and not a fleet-wide issue, it might undermine their confidence in flying on the airliner. And in fact, when John Purvis and his team found the smoking gun evidence, the Japanese Aircraft Accident Investigation Commission didn't want them to go public. It was criminal, after all. So, out of frustration, the head of the National Transportation Safety Board at the time, Jim Burnett, a widely regarded NTSB chief, by the way, told his lead investigator, Ron Schleed, to leak the story to the New York Times, which he did. The U.S. team felt it was crucial to let the world know the 747 fleet was safe. So they leaked it to the New York Times so the world would know that this was a problem unique to this particular airplane because of the repair and not something that was endemic in the whole 747 fleet? Yes, and also people were concerned about the possibility of terrorism as well. It allayed a lot of concerns that people had at the time, and because the Japanese were interested in a criminal investigation, they didn't want to let anybody know that. So that was the conundrum, and that was when Jim Burnett took this, well, I guess you could call it, as people at the NTSB say, nobody officially talks to the media at the NTSB, but everybody talks to the media at the NTSB and use the media as a tool in this case to get the word out. But you know, at the bottom line here, it's important to underscore, the mechanics weren't criminals. 
but it still has got to be a heavy burden. Do you think some of those people had trouble sleeping after this? Second-guessing themselves, I'm sure. I'm sure. I have myself. I've second-guessed myself sometimes. There's a few things that happened in my career that I'd like to have back again. After John Purvis returned to Seattle, his bosses at Boeing told him that he was on the no-fly list to Japan. They eventually put the whole team, I believe, on a no-fly list. And just to make sure they covered their bases, they put the investigative team, at least the Boeing part of it, on a no-fly, including myself. Okay, I get it. When something as horrible as this happens, we all want to know where to point the finger. Someone should be blamed, held accountable. But in aviation accidents, they are seldom entirely the fault of one event or one entity or one person. And in fact, that is the case with Japan Airlines Flight 123. But here is where Japan Airlines is really different, I think. It has built a museum dedicated to the fact that it has failed. And the only way to do better is to take that blame on board and learn from it. So wait, they build a museum to showcase their mistake? Lars, you've got to go sometime. It's stunning, it takes your breath away, and the candor with which this whole story is presented is striking to me. And I, I can't imagine, another, well, I, I know that there's not another place like this in the world. There's no other airline that has a publicly accessible museum to all of its airplane crashes. That just doesn't happen. <laughs> We will soon arrive at Haneda Airport International Terminal. I asked my good friend and producer, Fumio Asahi, if she would arrange a visit for us to the Japan Airlines Safety Promotion Center. That's the official title of what I just called the museum. It happens to be at Haneda Airport in Tokyo. This is where Japan Airlines Flight 123 began its flight. It is open to the public, but it's not a real museum because it's in a nondescript office building on the sixth floor. You have to know about it and you have to make an appointment. Primarily, this is a place built for airline employees. For them, visits to it are mandatory. Our guide? Masato Mukoyama, manager of corporate safety and security. It's mostly focused on Flight 123, but not exclusively. First of all, we have these uh, JAL major aircraft accidents. We have uh, seven aircraft accidents of passengers' fatalities. The first one happened in 1952. A twin-engine Martin 202 flew into a mountain, killing all 37 aboard. In 1977, a DC-8 carrying cargo stalled and crashed, departing Anchorage, Alaska. The captain was intoxicated, and the crew knew it, but failed to stop him. In 1982, another DCA crashed on approach to Tokyo. The captain had some kind of psychotic break. And then, of course, in 1985, Flight 123, the airline's last accident with fatalities. I think it's just amazing that an airline would build a museum showcasing their mistakes and they'd require all their employees to go there and learn from them. Airlines, you know, they make maintenance mistakes, but some of these mistakes really reflect badly on the airline's culture. So the kind of uh, circumspection and the humility that you have to have to build a museum and expose your own flaws is extraordinary. I think it's just another way that Japanese culture makes this particular accident so unique and so interesting. Well, I think every airline, while they don't build a museum, tries to inculcate that in its people. A safety culture is what we like to call it. But only Japan Airlines, as far as I know, has anything like this. You know, I remember being at the Fukushima nuclear power plant. I met the operator who was there the day of the meltdowns. He and his team worked heroically in the dark, assuming they were going to die to try to save that plant from a natural disaster that was not their fault. And yet he took personal responsibility for the actions and felt he could never atone for those actions. His neighbors wouldn't even speak to him. So there's a kind of sense of responsibility that Americans don't quite get. So I think what you have in this case is aviation safety culture meeting Japan responsibility culture. And that creates this kind of environment. 
I seem to recall that one of the four survivors of the accident was a flight attendant for JAL, although she wasn't on duty. But still, when she went to the hospital, I recall that she was filled with shame around the other survivors because of what her employer, the airline, had done. Well, it's really interesting because when Fumio went to that memorial service, there was a distinct separation between the families of the passengers and the families of the Japan Airlines crew, which I thought was incredibly poignant and sad. But that is a part of the culture there. And this is what it's at work while I'm visiting this remarkable place. Okay, now let's go into the middle room. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Now we have just entered the uh, main room. It was a very intense moment. As you can see, we have displayed the actual items, debris of the aircraft. Seats mangled and charred. The front seats are more damaged compared to the rear seats, yeah? Passenger belongings, glasses, pens, Watches. All the watches are stopped at uh, 656. Calculators and keys, bent keys, lenses, bent pens. Japan Airlines still uh, holds these uh, items, over 2,000 items in storage. And of course, there are those Isho notes, the gut wrenching letters as people were realizing their fate. Some people try to leave their message to their family. Yes. Mm. I've read this one. This one is very moving to me. Yeah. And I realized then and there that I had been focusing a little too much on the cause of the accident. I hadn't paid enough attention to the effect, but it hit me right there for sure. Every time I go in this uh, uh, facility, I always feel um, very solemn Mm. and sad. Lars, there's a library there as well. It's a big wall of shelves filled with books all on the crash. New ones appear all the time in Japan. The accident has triggered a cottage industry of alternative and conspiracy theories. It's extraordinary to me how much has been written here. Is there are dozens of In books. all honesty, I mean, is, is much of it, would you say, accurate? Um, I don't think so. There are all kinds of theories. We talked about some of them earlier. That it was shot down, that there was another failure that was the fault of the airline, and Boeing took the blame to cover that up. Some people believe opponents of then-Japanese Prime Minister Nakasone were on the plane and were the actual targets. There are accusations of missing bodies, and bodies burned twice. And there's even an allegation of a poisoning of one researcher pushing all these alternate theories. Why are there so many competing theories after all these years, do you think? To be honest with you, the investigation report is not uh, accurate enough. There are some vague statements, so that may induce the uh, wish from the public to to know more. Where is the accident report too vague, you think? should it be? Yes, this, in some parts, uh, you know, it was supposed that uh, blah, 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 or it was um, presumed that blah, 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 or something. And also, they didn't come to the root of the cause of the um, actual reason why they made mistakes, right? To this day, no one has heard publicly from the mechanics who made that bad repair, the people who turned the wrenches and fired the rivet guns and snipped that splice plate in two. Would it be worthwhile after all these years to reopen the investigation and fill in some of those vague aspects? Do you think that would be of value? We are in the position of uh, the company who caused this accident. We should be investigated. Many people question the investigation report. And of course, there is a lot here about the official And I think you and I agree, the real cause as well. We're at the top of the vertical stabilizer and leading edge, kind of, and the aluminum is peeled away. The aluminum is peeled away. You easily imagine there must be some uh, explosion of Mm -hmm. uh, air happened inside. 
when you look at that, it's quite obvious that whatever was happening was coming from, you know, internally. It was blown mm, inter- out. Yeah, blown yeah out. internally. You know, I think any time you lose a loved one and there's any level of uncertainty at all, you go to that place. Is there someone to blame? Is there someone more proximal to the event that I could blame? Is there someone with malice? Is it possible it wasn't a mistake? Is it possible that it was intentional? Was there a target on the plane? Was it intentional shoot down? Was there a terrorist who decided the airplane should come down by planting a bomb? I think it's a natural human reaction, but frankly, reading the accident investigation report, it's really hard to imagine they didn't get it right. So then Mukayama-san showed me something in the tale that was a complete surprise. I hadn't read about this. It's hard to see, so they've installed a special mirror. There's a rectangular hole, but it divides the fuselage and the vertical fin. It's a rectangular internal passageway on top of the tail section. It's right underneath the vertical stabilizer. If it weren't there, it would be a sunroof. It's big enough for a mechanic to crawl through the unpressurized part of the tail and into the inside of the vertical stabilizer. With that hole open, the air that rushed out of that rupture bulkhead flowed right into the tail fin, literally blowing it up and off, severing the four hydraulic lines. So why was that passageway, that hole, left open? At the time of the accident, covering it was not required by Boeing. This is one more failing of the manufacturer that led to this crash. But the airline carries some blame as well. Remember that whole thing about this particular 747 model, the short-range version, and how Boeing told Japan Airlines to lower the cabin pressure? In fact, they were still pressurizing it to the full amount. That's John Purvis, Boeing's lead crash investigator in 1985. But the inspections they were doing was based on the lower pressure. So they were pressurizing it higher and inspecting it as if it was being flown at a lower pressure. The inspections needed to be more frequent. If they had been doing it, there's a possibility, maybe a good probability that somebody, even on a visual inspection, would have found it. Japan Airlines disputes John Purvis's claim that the airline was not inspecting that bulkhead frequently enough, given the amount of pressure those planes were flying with. Miyuki Ito, who is in the public relations department, sent us a note saying, and I'm quoting now, we have checked with the maintenance guy, and he said that the inspection at the time was performed according to Boeing's recommended maintenance program, and there was no problem, end quote. Regardless of this, blame for the crash is not as clear-cut as it might have seemed. Besides, in Japan, as we've been saying, they are culturally hardwired to own up when things go wrong. This remarkable macabre museum is proof of that. They trusted Japan Airlines. They boarded Japan Airlines' flight, and they have nothing to do with Boeing. They have nothing to do with a tail strike seven years ago. This is what we caused. So we are responsible for this accident. Now, in the aftermath of the incident, a Japan Airlines maintenance manager committed suicide to atone for the incident. And so did an engineer who had inspected and cleared the aircraft as flightworthy. The president and CEO of the airline resigned. Today, employees, many of whom weren't alive when the accident happened, must all visit this place the safety center, and they must sign a safety pledge book. Mukoyama-san showed me his. There is a blank space in which we have to fill in my own safety pledge. What is your pledge? My my pledge is uh, I will um, share information with my colleagues. First and foremost, I will share information with my colleagues. I'm grateful he made that pledge. Kuniko Miyajima has the same philosophy. Remember, she's the mother who lost her nine-year-old son, Ken, on that flight. Today, she travels all over the world talking to airline employees, kids in classrooms, really anybody who will listen, about the importance of safety. 
子供たちにやっぱりきちんと。I feel children understand better than adults. This means that if we teach all our children now to protect their friend's life, if they learn and think from the bottom of their heart, I think they won't forget during their lifetime. I do not know how long I will live, but I have homework Ken gave me that. I have to do. This is to tell people about the accident. This is really the tale of two cities, you know? Americans, like, we don't know the name of the engineer who designed this. And I'm not saying that's bad or good, but in Japan, the maintenance manager who wasn't responsible committed suicide. So it's just kind of like a cultural dichotomy between. Exposing and taking responsibility for our faults versus just trying to cover them up. And I don't mean to say cover up, but not to evade responsibility, but just culturally not to make a big deal about them. And Japanese culture seems to be so steeped in taking responsibility for your actions, but even more broadly, those of your team or the company. People that had nothing to do with this accident, that worked for Japan Airlines, still to this day, Do not mix necessarily socially with even at the memorial events with relatives of the victims on their flight, even though they have nothing to do with the accident. I just find that fascinating example of the cultural differences that define the United States and Japan. So, this accident, like all accidents, has taught some lessons that prompted important changes aimed at improving aviation safety. The NTSB recommended that there be larger emergency vent doors in the tail, that the four redundant hydraulic lines not be routed right next to each other, all simultaneously vulnerable to a single point of failure, and that the aft pressure bulkhead fail safe design and any repair techniques have to be re examined and tested. They also recommended that periodic inspection for cracks be more thorough, not just visual. Using non destructive techniques like eddy currents and x rays, that sort of thing. The NTSB did not recommend it, but aircraft today are equipped with hydraulic fuses and they seal off the system upstream of a rupture. So it preserves some of the ability to control the aircraft, at least partially. As for that passageway between the unpressurized portion of the tail and the vertical stabilizer, long before the investigation was finished, Boeing issued a service bulletin mandating installation of a cover over it before any flight. And what about the 747 SR, or short range? Boeing built only 29 of them. Japan Airlines and ANA started phasing them out in the 90s. They replaced them with wide body twin engine aircraft like the 767, more efficient. They flew SRs on domestic routes until the early 2000s. As for the rest of the global 747 fleet, its days of carrying passengers are all but over. They were well on their way to retirement before the pandemic, and that just hastened the sunset of that era. So the lessons of Japan Airlines 123 live on in the successors of the 747. We do thank you for listening. It's really important that we hear from you. Like, subscribe, send us comments, emails, tweet at us. We really don't care how it comes. We'll take the good, the bad, and the ugly. Of course, we prefer the good. But we'd like to hear what you think. And we have an idea for our next podcast, assuming you guys like this one. This is a story that Lars flagged to me. It's a very interesting case. Next time, we'll hear from the pilot of an Airbus A380 who had an uncontained engine failure. Which led to a cascade of other failures and the worst damage that has ever occurred to an Airbus aircraft, which landed safely. His calm, cool, analytical approach under stress no doubt saved a lot of lives. Hey.